Well, what a privilege it has been to, to witness and celebrate in the baptisms this morning. It has often been said that baptism is a public expression of an inward commitment. It is to proclaim to the world that those who have been baptized identify with Christ, buried in the likeness of his death and raised in the likeness of his resurrection. It is to agree with the Apostle Paul as he wrote to the church in Corinth, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 20. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that is in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ God making his appeal through us we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And so here in this one passage, we see new identity as a new creation in Christ. And we see new focus and mission, the ministry of reconciliation as ambassadors. For all followers of Christ, our appeal to the world is the same and it is, as Paul says, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And so as followers of Christ, we have been commissioned to go and proclaim that Jesus is Lord. Jesus gave his disciples the great commission. You are familiar with it. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And so that is the mission to go and make disciples. There is a, a method, there is a pattern to discipleship that I want us to consider this morning. And there is also a cost of discipleship. And both the method and the cost are laid out in the life and death of our Savior, Jesus Christ. This morning we are continuing through our series through the Gospel of Mark, and we come to a section where both the method or the pattern of discipleship is presented as well as the cost of discipleship. And so you can turn with me to Mark chapter 6. As some of you know, our title for this whole series has been Eyes to See and a Path to Follow. And it is today that we come face to face with a path, with the path that has been laid before us. And so I'm going to read Mark 6 to, or Mark 6 verses 7 to 13. And he called the 12, Jesus called the 12 and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. So may God bless the reading of his word. Now up to this point in the life and teachings of Jesus, the disciples have been observers for the most part. They have followed Jesus, they have witnessed his miraculous healings and his authoritative preaching. 
They have witnessed Jesus calm the storms and cast out demons. They have seen the healings. They have witnessed him raise the dead, the daughter of Jairus. And then in the passage that we looked at last week, we also see that the disciples witnessed Jesus being rejected in his hometown. After that sobering experience of seeing Jesus being despised and rejected, it is then that Jesus sends out the disciples in pairs to proclaim the gospel of God. And so just in these verses that I've read here this morning, we see several details worth noting, and I want to work through them fairly quickly, and then we'll continue on this morning. Uh, Number one, they are sent out two by two. So I have six details here worth noting. Number one, they are sent out two by two. This This is fellowship. This is teamwork. This is accountability. There is a measure of safety here as they go together. It also establishes accuracy of events by two or three witnesses. That was how they were to operate. I think it also would have been helpful as a disciple to go with one other person because they would have heard Jesus talking and preaching and proclaiming as they went from village to village, and now they can work together and and kind of correct one another as they share the message. Number two, they are told to travel light. We see this in verse eight. Take nothing for your journey except a staff and sandals, no bread, no bag, no money, no second set of clothes. Now, we could suggest that this is therefore the pattern for all all missionaries of all time in all places to live with little. However, we need to take the Bible as a whole. And so... Jesus gives different criteria later on. We see this in Luke twenty-two thirty-five to 36. And Jesus said to them, when I sent you out with no money bag or knapsack or sandals, did you lack anything? They said nothing. He said to them, but now let the one who has a money bag take it and likewise a knapsack and let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. So now we have two passages that are not aligned. And so I would argue that for this first short trip, the disciples for that time were to go with very little. They, were need, they needed to be remi- dependent upon hospitality of others and reminded of the provision of God. And so we see that There are different approaches to being sent out. The the supply list changes with the specific circumstances. But I think there is a word here for us to rely on the body of Christ, the the dependence on others, and on the provision of God. Thirdly, they are told to stay in the first place that welcomes them. We're not really told why. Why? Some suggest that over time, as they were in an area, as they were ministering, as they were healing the sick and casting out demons, that that maybe they would have been approached and told to come to a, a nicer place and enjoy the some some better hospitality. And so Jesus said to stay in the first place that they welcome you. Honor those that open their doors to you. If we wanted to find a principle for us today, we could suggest that we should not use our ministry success to increase our standard of living. Again, we're, we're, we're speculating there a little bit, but uh, that is for us to, to work through as, as the body here. Number four, we read that if they are rejected, they are to shake off the dust that is on their feet Verse 11, as a testimony against them. And so here is our first indication that rejection and resistance may be experienced. I believe this is part of the cost of discipleship. Jesus has already prepared the disciples for this. For in Nazareth, Jesus was rejected. The people there took offense at him. 
But we must ask, why the shaking off of the dust? Well, in that time, to shake the dust off was a symbolic act of judgment. It was the Jews of the day that would have shaken off the pagan dust off their sandals after being in Gentile territory and then re-entering into the Holy Land. And so they were saying, we don't want to bring this impurity into our sacred space. And so what is striking here is that the disciples are Jewish, going into Jewish villages, and yet practicing this symbolic act of judgment upon those who have rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so that which is unclean or impure is changing now. It is not ethnic, but it is belief and faith. The Apostle Paul also did this during his missionary journeys. We read in Acts 13.51, But they, Paul and his companions, shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. Number five, they went and proclaimed that people should repent. Uh, this was the message summarized. Repent, turn away from your sin and unbelief. This was what John the Baptist was proclaiming. Mark 1 verse 4, John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. It was the same message as Jesus. Mark 1 15, Jesus says this, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now, to proclaim a message of repentance is to point out sin. It is to acknowledge that there is something to repent of and from. And so the message is ultimately offensive because it requires humility. It requires a turning away. It confronts our pride. And so this is to be a challenge for us as disciple makers today. If you think of our interactions with those outside of these walls, if all that we proclaim to others is that God loves you, which is true, but if that is all that is shared, then there is really nothing to repent of. And so if, if you are put your self in the shoes of a non-Christian, if, if a Christian tells you that God loves you and sent Jesus to die on the cross so that you can go to heaven, then the response would likely be, well, that's great. Thanks for the, the free ticket into heaven. But we know that that is not the whole truth. In the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are confronted with our sin we are confronted with how we have worshipped other things over God. We are confronted ultimately with our pride that would rather be in control, that we would rather be in control of our lives and not God. I was thinking of the Apostle Paul as he proclaimed the good news, the gospel of God. And we see his great work in the book of Romans proclaiming and rejoicing in the good news but let's be reminded that Paul does not sugarcoat the truth. And so turn with me to Romans chapter 1. I think it's important for us to read this often. In Romans 1, we have Paul introducing himself. He's highlighting the privilege that he has to proclaim the, the good news in, verses, in chapters 1, verse 16, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And then let me read the rest of the chapter begin, beginning in verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. 
For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so that they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or gave thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to a dishonorable passions. For their women exchange natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless, Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. It's a sobering word. Yes, the gospel is good news, but the bad news of our sin is often far greater than we know. And once our sin is exposed before us, it is the gospel of Jesus Christ that becomes all the more beautiful and glorious. And so the message, going back to our point here, they are to proclaim a message of repentance. Let's continue on. Number six. They cast out many demons and healed the sick. We see this in verse 13. This is the power of God on display for all to see. We see in this passage, this was authority given to the disciples by Jesus. We see this in verse 7. And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. So this is delegated authority. It is not in and of the disciples themselves, but rather given to them by Jesus to be upon them as they preach a message of repentance. They are announcing that the kingdom of God is in their midst and the casting out of demons and the healing of the sick confirm that this is true. Jesus said this as well. Luke eleven twenty, these are the words of Jesus. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Therefore, the displays of the miraculous were to authenticate the identity of Jesus as the Messiah of the King and his coming kingdom. As we go back to this passage here in Mark, we see that we've, we've covered this first section, the sending out of the 12. But our, our, our passage this morning is actually goes right to verse 30. And so we actually have 17 more verses in our passage. But I want you to see here that where we left off in verse 13... Um, 
if we were to skip from there to verse 30, we would see how it would tie together very nicely. So let me just read verse 13. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. And then if you skip to verse 30, which is our last verse in our text, it says, the apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And so what we find here is that there is there is another story here injected into the first story. And if you have been paying attention, we've been talking about this literary device several times in this series. This is, in fact, another Markin sandwich with the beginning, the middle, and the end. The middle part of the story helping us understand the whole so we have the sending out of the 12 disciples now connected to the story of the death of John the Baptist, for that is what we read of in this middle section. So this helps shape our understanding of the cost of discipleship, the cost of following Jesus. And so let me read this middle section beginning in verse 14. King Herod heard of it, heard of all that was going on, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. So now as a reader, we're, we're, we're already made aware here that John the Baptist is no longer alive. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said he is Elijah, and others said he is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, whatever you ask, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, For what should I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in and immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry. But because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Pretty sobering, again, words, grisly account of all that took place here. Now, obviously, there is much here. We could spend several Sundays working through this all. I would love to talk about the parallelism between King Herod and his wicked wife and John with King Ahab and his wicked wife Jezebel and Elijah. I would love to talk about that this morning, but... I can't right now. I would love to talk about the parallels between John's arrest and innocence and his death by one who was surprised at the request and with Jesus' arrest and his innocence and his death under Pilate who was surprised at the request for his death. 
I would love to contrast the way we read that John's disciples came and took the body of John and buried him with how Jesus' disciples were nowhere to be found when Jesus' body was taken off the cross and where Joseph of Arimathea instead stepped up and prepared his body for the tomb. There is indeed much here for us to mine and uncover and ponder upon. However, on the surface, this story is straightforward enough. Mark introduces this section with Herod, hearing of this name Jesus and the buzz that is going on in Galilee. Herod was the ruler at that time over Galilee and Perea. This was not Herod the Great, the one that tried to kill Jesus in Bethlehem, but rather this is one of his sons, Herod Antipas. He was not technically a king, but Mark describes him that way, I believe, for us to think back on King Ahab and Jezebel. This Herod heard about Jesus and all that was going on and wondered if it was John the Baptist back from the dead causing a ruckus in Herod's region. This likely points to Herod's sense of fear and guilt over the death of John for as we already read, John was the one, John was killed by the word of Herod because of his foolishness and pride. John the Baptist had been arrested earlier. He had been seized and bound because John had called Herod out on his sin. His adulterous and immoral relationship with Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. So you can understand the debauchery of this man married to his brother's wife. And it was Herodias that had it out for John, held a grudge against him. And so when this opportunity arose for Herodias to exact revenge on John the Baptist for calling out their sin, she acted swiftly and had John killed. And again, there is much that we could discuss further from this passage. We could talk about the downward spiral of pride or the damaging consequences of sexual sin, or the foolishness of flippant vows, or the dangers of weak men and wicked women. These are all worthy and legitimate concerns and topics that could be addressed from this passage. However, what we must grapple with this morning is why did Mark insert this story in the middle of the 12 disciples being sent out as ambassadors of Christ? And I believe the answer is for us as the readers to see the path that is put forth for those who will follow Jesus. John the Baptist preached a message of repentance. He confronted sin in others and he lost his life for it. Suffering and hardship await those who commit to following the way of the Lord. Now there is much encouragement and blessing as well as we follow Christ, but there is no immunity from trials and opposition. The reality is, for the 12 disciples, they all faced great adversity, and all of them were killed for their faith and commitment to Christ, except John the disciple, who ended up being exiled on the island of Patmos, and also Judas, who betrayed Jesus and took his own life. But the rest of the disciples were martyred for Christ. So consider these words of Jesus to those that gathered around him and his disciples, Mark 8, 34 to 38. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, 
If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And so opposition is to be expected. Again, consider the words of Jesus to his disciples, Matthew 10, 16 to 22. Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues. And you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and children will will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Again, these are sobering words. And if you read the book of Acts with this in mind, you see that these very words are fulfilled in the lives of the early church. They endured much, but they counted it all joy. And so there is a great great cost of discipleship, and there is also a great reward. Let me read a couple more passages here, Romans 5, 3 to 5. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And then in 1 Peter 4, 12 to 13, Beloved, Do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you also may rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. And so this morning we've considered the pattern and the cost of discipleship. But in closing, I want us to consider one last component of discipleship that is woven in and through this text. And so I would say it is the essence of discipleship. And I believe we can get there by asking for a disciple of Jesus and as a disciple of Jesus How are we to define success? How do we define success as a disciple of Jesus? Keep our passage in mind. We read that the disciples were sent out and they returned and and they rejoiced in what they had done. We read that in the other Gospels. But we also have the story of John the Baptist who proclaimed a message of repentance and was killed. So again, how do we define success? And I know that much could be said on this, but I'll give you one word, and that word is faithful. Faithful. We define success through faithfulness. 
1 Corinthians 4, this is the Apostle Paul, verses 1 and 2. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. And so may we have eyes to see and a willingness to continue on the path that is set before us. May we be found faithful to the faithful one. Please stand with me and we'll have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, you've been gracious to us as we have gathered here. We have celebrated much. We've celebrated the work of your Spirit in the lives of our brothers who were baptized today proclaiming that Jesus is Lord. We've had the privilege of opening up your word, reading of the sending of the twelve, recognizing the cost, seeing the, the foolishness of a king that resulted in the life of one of your followers. And so, Father, we, we consider these things and we're brought to a place where we acknowledge our need for Christ today, our need for the work of the Spirit in our lives. In ourselves, we are, we are unfaithful. We, are, we, we lack courage we lack boldness. But with your spirit, you give us boldness, you give us courage, you give us conviction, you grow in us a steadfastness. Father, we thank you that Jesus was faithful on the path that you had for him to the cross. And you've called us to take up our cross. And so Lord, today, as we stand here before you, may we be counted as those that will be faithful. Do 